Yeah, that was the start of Skid Row. Uh, there were three piece at that time, weren't they? Yeah, they were a four piece. Because mm. there was guitar, Bernie Cheevers on guitar, Nolik Bridgman on drums, Brush on bass and vocals, and Phil on lead vocals. And they got together in September 1967 and rehearsed for a couple of months and started gigging around about the end of October and were instantly very successful. And, uh, you know, in, in no time at all, they were one of the top groups in Ireland, you know. We were back in Dublin at uh, Christmas 1970, and uh, I saw Brian, and uh, he was in partnership with a guy called Peter Barden, and, and, and they invited me to dinner, and they played me the acetate of the Thin Lizzy, of Thin Lizzy's first album. And uh, was, I, Just I to in, was interrupt great. you there a second, was Phil gone then from Skid Row at this stage and was now with yeah, Lizzie? Phil, what happened was uh, uh, Bernie Cheevers, who was playing with Skid Row, who was a very good guitarist, but he was semi-pro. He, he, he worked the ESB, I think. He was an electrician. And Gary Moore turned up and Brush uh, recognized the talent and got him in. And then he decided to go as a three-piece, like kind of like Cream or... or you know, that sort of thing, you know, and there was no room really for Phil. So Phil got the elbow. But to soften the blow, uh, the brush taught him to play bass. And uh, so Phil then put his own band together with Brian Downey and a couple of other guys. It was called Orphanage, and, and they did a bit with that, and that didn't kind of... They, they were they were uh, doing okay, And but then a guy called Eric Rickson, who was a, 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 an organist from Belfast who happened to be in Dublin, saw them playing in a club and said, do you, uh, you, know, do you want to form a band? And So they, they, they put Thin Lizzy together uh, with Eric Bell, who also wanted to play with them. And um, they worked as a four-piece initially for a short period, and then Eric uh, left, and they were left just as a three-piece with Phil, um, Eric, and, and Brian. So when you talked to Brian Chute, then he played you that... Uh Recording of the debut album, which they'd done they, for Decca. You, 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 you were impressed with that, released. yeah? They had already recorded it. I, I knew about it because when they were in London before, in, like in November and December recording it, uh, we, we, you know, we saw them because we all knew them, you know, and they came out to the house where we were living and stuff. So, but I hadn't heard anything until Brian played me the acetate of the album, and I was very impressed with it, especially the songs. And... Uh, so I agreed to uh, go into partnership with him and, 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 and manage Thin Lizzy and Mellow Candle and Elmer Fudd, which were the three bands that he was working with at the time. He needed somebody to... Uh, Thin Lizzy were moving to, to England because they had to go to promote the album and stuff, so he needed somebody to get involved and who knew what was going on in England. So uh, I was kind of the ideal person at the time. And then uh, about a year or so later, we recorded a second album called Shades of a Blue Orphanage. And uh, then uh, at that stage, it was, it was a bit after that, that myself and, and Brian uh, split up the management thing. And I, I went into partnership with a guy called Chris Morrison in, in, in London. And it was around that time that uh, we just we wanted to get out of Decca because we felt Decca weren't really committed to the band, you know. We, they, they, you know, they'd had a lot of good kind of press and, and radio play on the al both albums. Kid Jensen, who was one of the top DJs at the time, he had a he had a show called Jensen's Dimensions on um, on Luxembourg, and he it, he made both albums his number one album. At, at, at when they, when it was out, you know, so we had a lot of radio play and stuff, but we felt that Decca didn't really capitalize, so we wanted to get out of Decca, and uh, we went to see Frank Rogers, who was an old friend of of Brian's, who who uh, had, Brian had got the introduction to Decca through through his his um, association with Frank, you know. This is Brian Chute who got the deal with for Decca, but you weren't particularly happy when you took over the band then. Uh, no, I the was deal. very happy. I had no problems at all. It was, uh, it, it was, it was. I mean, it was a big thing to have a record deal in those days. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, 
the business was very different then, and it wasn't easy to get a record deal. You know? Was it a real kind of uh, old-fashioned rock and roll lifestyle that these boys were were doing in the early days about the the cheap gigs and the transit van? Was that was that was what it was oh, like? It, it, it was all that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean. Uh, Brian ha- had a Brian had previously managed uh, a, another Irish band uh, co- called um, Granny's Intentions, who who again were a really good band, but they'd never they never quite cracked it, you know. And we had their old Transit. Well, it was Brian. It belonged to to Brian, so we we started off with that, but that didn't last very long. And then we I think we rented an Avis van for a few months, and then eventually we managed to get hold of another Transit. But that was it. The band. The roadies, the gear, all in, in in a van, up and schlepping up and down uh, England, and I, I would often go with them and drive. You know, I'd go to maybe a third of the gigs. You know, just to just to see how things were were going on the road and so on. You know. Yeah, um, he's. They have two albums now, um, just slightly further on. The first one is seventy one. Then towards the end of seventy two, the second album came out. That's right. Yes. Um, uh, Whiskey in the Jar is is the one single that cracked it for them, really. But well, this was originally was, going to be a B side, wasn't? It? Uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, what happened was we uh, say so when when Brian when uh, Chris Morrison came in and and Brian. Um, uh, basically stopped managing the band to concentrate on, on, on his business and his family commitments and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, he'd, he'd gone as far as he could, but we, the, uh, frankly, at that stage, the band, you know, because we weren't really getting the support of Decca, was kind of at a crossroads and it really was in a situation where it probably couldn't carry on for probably more than another six months unless something happened to kind of boost things. So... Uh, as I say, we, myself and Chris decided we'd try and get out of Decca, the Decca deal. We went to see Frank Rogers and we said, look, you know, you're obviously not that interested. Uh, I mean, Frank was interested in the band, but he, he was ruled by the people further up the ladder, you know, uh, who control the purse strings. And uh, uh, we said, you know, can, can, you know you might, why don't you just give us a release and, you know, we'll call it a day, you know. And uh, he said, well, I don't think I don't think they'd agree to that. He said, I'll tell you what, how, why don't you make a, uh, just make one more single, we'll see how that does. And then, uh, you know, if it doesn't, if nothing happens with that, uh, we can get you out, you know. So that was the thing. So Phil had this song, Black Boys on the Corner, which was kind of a rocky, melodic kind of, you know, funky kind of record. It was a, It was kind of... It was designed to, I mean, we kind of hoped it might be a hit, or at least it would pick up a lot of radio play. It was a bit like a kind of a Deep Purple thing, and that style of rock was melodic, heavyish rock was popular at the time. So that was going to be the the, the A side, and 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 whiskey in the jar was just a throwaway because Phil didn't want to use another one of his original songs. He was saving them those for the the third album, you know, because. When he was in Dublin uh, and just doing odd gigs, you know, and stuff, he was he had a chance to write a lot of material. But when he came to England, the band was working. jar was something they'd been doing live and it had been going down well and uh, it was just something to break things up because uh, in that Phil played rhythm guitar instead of bass and it just was just a little kind of bit of variety in the set you know and it went down well so he said well maybe we could try this I said go ahead and play it and hear it and as soon as I heard it I just was knocked out completely because they had a really good arrangement and uh, you know they had a great intro from Eric and, and uh, a great solo and everything, you know. So to me, as soon as I heard it, I thought that sounds like a hit, you know. It seemed to have all the... Ing- 